Aloha. I get quite a few questions from people about um, sustainable food production uh, in Hawaii, um, questions about being self-sufficient in Hawaii, um, and, and the like. And so I thought I might like to address that a little bit today. I've been involved personally in uh, food production one way or another uh, most of my life. Um, my observation is that, uh, simple answer, sure, sustainable food production in Hawaii and self-sufficiency, uh, yeah, I mean, hey, th there would have been no Hawaii uh, when the English first got here if the local residents uh, from southern Polynesia had not managed to become self-sufficient here on these islands, okay? Um, you know, as a matter of whether you like living on taro, uh, uh, fish and flightless birds, or whatever, you know, uh, the diet today is significantly different for all of us than it was uh, at one point in time. Uh, but depending on what you like to eat, it is entirely possible to produce a large portion of the food you eat here. Hawaii is a friendly climate. We have pretty good rainfall. Some places have good soils and so on. Uh, it's uh, quite suitable for a lot of different forms of agriculture. The, the American history of this, these islands uh, has been all about uh, large-scale corporate agriculture. Um, all those guys are all gone today. Uh, Actually, that's pretty good. I like that. Um, it used to be the story of pineapples here in Hawaii. Uh, you know, there were the sugar companies, C&H, their dole was the pineapple people, and so on. Uh, there were very, very large coffee farming efforts here back in the 19th century. Uh, today, all of that huge agriculture has left the islands, which, of course, with one exception, uh, uh, the one that most of us love to beat on, and uh, the genetic engineering people still love to work here because they can breed generations and generations of crop seeds within a single 12-month period in this kind of a climate. Uh, so take it or leave it, whether it's gotten better or worse lately. But most of the land that at one time was uh, uh, under huge corporate agriculture here today is now uh, in private hands. Uh, either as just residents or small farms and so on. So there's an awful lot of land over here uh, available for the purpose of growing food. Um, the government of Hawaii uh, backs the idea, pushes towards it, of Hawaii being a, a, a sustainable uh, food producer uh, to limit the net imports of foods that we have to bring in here and produce more food locally. Uh, the idea of local food production uh, is is hot here in Hawaii, perhaps even more so than it is anywhere else uh, in the U.S. simply because of our uh, isolation. We're way out here. Anything ever happened, we probably wish that we were producing most of our own food. And so it's an important issue socially. Um, and that is the point. Socially, a lot of times when I hear people talk about self-sufficient living, these are rather, uh, uh, they're, they're personal, they're solo things. You know, a guy's going to strike out in the Alaskan wilderness and he's going to live on moose and stuff like this, you know. That sort of a mindset, the rugged individualist. Um, well, you know, Hawaii is a community. It's a group of fairly small islands. Hawaii is a community of people. Uh, we're all together out here in the middle of the ocean. And so when we talk about sustainable food production, we really are, I think, that we're really talking about sustainable food production for a community. Um, for years, I have produced large amounts of the food that I personally eat and my family eats. Uh, this has become a normal state of affairs, at least in my household. Um, I've become successful enough at it that most of the time I'm also producing food for other people around me to eat, the neighbors, you know, and so on. And so my food production here uh, has become a community thing. 
Um, and I really think that's the best way to look at sustainable food production. You know, you've got one guy down the road over here, well, he grows bananas real well, but this guy over here, he knows how to grow pineapples, or conditions are better here or there in the soils and so on, for one thing or another. And so diversified agriculture is a great idea. I don't like monocropping. If you're trying to produce wide varieties of foodstuffs in a given environment, it really works better uh, when you uh, uh, focus on this at a community level. Uh, many people involved in the process of producing a variety of different things and then exchanging these goods via for money, for services, whatever it might be, standard commerce. You know. um, and I really think that's, that's what self-sufficiency means here and sustainability from my point of view. Uh, not just one person going it alone. Uh, if you're, uh, you know, a person living, uh, say, in the upper Midwest or the eastern United States or somewhere uh, where there is a considerable amount of massive agriculture that goes on because of climates and soils, uh, you'll probably find that Hawaii is not really that well suited to that style of farming. There's a few places here that are. Um, Central Valley in Maui, you know, there's a few spots here on the south and on the north side of the Big Island uh, that work for that sort of a thing of large areas of relatively flat soils and so on. But you know, in general, farming here is, takes place on a small scale. Uh, it's a lot of the farming, like the famous Kona coffee. Uh, all the Kona coffee is grown on hard rock lava. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a daunting project, putting all that coffee in on the sides of a volcano into hard lava. And so uh, you're not going to see anybody raising 5,000 acres of coffee with tractors rolling between it around here. Uh, the model for agriculture around the Big Island is considerably much more like it is in lots of Asia, like the Japanese model, where you have people that actually successfully work, uh, you know, one to five acres of land, and that's considered a farm. Um, here in Hawaii, small parcels, one acre parcels, are considered farms. Um, this is this is really nice because having been a person who was born in the Midwest and lived for years in California and, and, and you know in Illinois or California, man, if you got less than two thousand acres, that ain't a farm. That's a joke, you know. You, really, you get laughed at, uh, and that's not right. But that's the way it is. Um, here, uh, there, the average coffee farm is you know one and a half to three acres, for instance, um, and that's normal. And the government uh, uh, goes with it, too. So you have the support of both the society, uh, community, and uh, government and its social farming services that will take you for real if you're trying to farm an acre in Hawaii. Um, that's uh, also the types of growing conditions, the tropical growing conditions here and the tropical soils that we have. Um, I don't really believe that these conditions are the best place for uh, the corporate mega industrial agriculture that we developed uh, during the 20th century. Um, uh, with most of the corporate agriculture having left these islands, it leaves open a lot of land and a lot of opportunities for people to do things in a uh, smaller uh, and I would say probably better way. Um, Food foresting here, for instance, is uh, an outstanding approach. It's typical of the way uh, uh, traditional farming had been done here. Uh, a lot of the really good and successful farms on the island, uh, sometimes it's difficult to tell where does the forest stop and the farm begin. They oftentimes kind of integrate. You'll see rows of coffee with mango trees and avocado trees and such, uh, you know, scattered through them. Uh, it's, you don't find so much of this straight line fence post to fence post stuff here. Um, because of the tropical conditions, using one crop to benefit another, and again, is an excellent idea. We call it stick mulching, where you'll take, say, a kakui nut or an ice cream bean, grow that in one row, and then next to it you grow a row of bananas or a row of papayas, and then you cut the inga or cut the... Uh, the uh, kakui nuts down and throw all the trash several times a year onto the top of the papayas or the bananas 
uh, to use as fertilizer and to maintain the soils. Um, these are good tropical approaches to agriculture. So much of what you might have learned in some other locality on the planet, if you come here and you attempt to try to raise your own food, you're, you could get a few surprises. Um, uh, to begin with, uh, I grew up in areas where we would, you know, take a tractor, plow the land up, disc it all down smooth and ram corn seed in it and oftentimes up and down the side of a hill instead of across and so on. Not uncommon in the Midwest to see that sort of thing. Well, y you try it here. You know, first thing that happens under the climate here in Pune is that the first rainstorm you get that comes through that's a 12 incher. It rips the soil and takes it right down the hillside carrying everything with it. And so it's not a real smart way to approach things. The clean, cultivated, uh, you know, the uh, Euro concept of, uh, of how you garden or farm, um, these systems don't work well here at all. It's just not a good idea. You burn the land out, the land erodes, and so on. So, you know, having a, a cover on the ground, constantly vegetated beneath your crops, crops integrated so that one's supporting the other, and so on, that kind of more complicated biological type of growing really works much better here. Um, you'll find if you come to the island and hang out with people that we probably have some of the most progressive biological agricultural ideas in the country here. The idea of uh, inoculating uh, um, uh, beneficial microbes, you know, um, growing indigenous microorganisms, IMOs, uh, and adding them to soils and crops and so on. Um, the biochar, uh, which uh, allowed cultures in the Amazon to survive for thousands of years on soils that we today do not know how to farm, they did, and biochar was part of that system. That That's another thing that's fairly common here in Hawaii. Uh, a lot of people I've met in the mainland have either never even heard of it, or uh, if they have heard of it, they're dubious and so on and so forth um, about its nature. But there's a lot of different, more unusual and modern, very, very modern and also very ancient techniques wound together that you'll find here in Hawaii. Um, you know, the ideas of uh, uh, Masanobu Fukuoka, the One Straw Revolution, a lot of his ideas, which are Japanese, actually apply pretty well here. Now, his climate isn't that different from where he was working. And a lot of the crops he grew actually will grow here to an extent. Which brings me to the other point. If you are a person who absolutely loves to eat your white Idaho baker potatoes and you love those great big giant beefsteak tomatoes, you know, anything's possible. But if you're living here in Hawaii and that's what you think you're going to be putting on your plate constantly, you're really going to be working for it. All right, that's a hard thing. Both of those crops, the, the, the uh, Peruvian style potato and the uh, tomato, both of those crops are susceptible to dozens and dozens of different diseases that are extremely common in this environment. Uh, you want to see a tomato plant turn black overnight after a 20 inch rainfall? Ha <laughs> ha, right here, I'm telling you. They get watered out and that thing just burns. The bacteria and the fungi attack the plants. It's the same thing the potatoes do. On the other hand, about 500 years ago, the sweet potato got here from South America. So the sweet potato is an outstanding crop in Hawaii. Uh, it, uh, there are not too many pests as of yet uh, that r are really messing with it. A new one got in here again recently that will mess with the sweet potato, but uh, it's still a very, very easy and it's an undemanding crop. It does not require large amounts of fertilizer. Um, the peanut actually does reasonably well over here if you happen to be on soil. For those of you who are on lava, well, I guess you could grow it in a bucket full of potting soil, but. Native uh, Hawaiians survived as a carb on uh, taro for so many years. Taro, or otherwise known as kalo. You know, tar taro is a traditional uh, high yielding crop in this environment. Now, it's not something that most Americans are familiar with eating. Every now and then, when they come on vacation and go to a luau, they might try some poi. Um, usually, the reaction is it tastes like purple wallpaper paste. Um, it's not too far off, actually, although there's a lot of different ways you can use a taro plant. Uh, they make chips out of them. Uh, the leaves are great for wrapping and steaming food in, uh, and you eat the leaf, too. It's called lao lao. It's a Samoan dish. Uh, the uh, 
Koi itself, what it's added to uh, uh, biscuits, breads, pancakes, waffles, it's awesome. I love Koi waffles. Okay. Anyhow, uh, you know, there's a lot of crops that really, really, really perform well in Hawaii. You know, the banana, for instance, probably one of the most valuable foodstuffs here. Bananas are very, very high yielding in the tropics. They can be eaten as green vegetables. They can be eaten as sweet fruit. Uh, the leaves and such are good for cooking in and for eating off of and so on. Uh, they, and they grow really well here. Um, uh, there are always issues. Uh, there's a bunchy top virus that's shown up in some of the commercial plantations here. Most of us small growers who are isolated from those plantations um, we don't have the problem with it, but, uh, you know, there's, there's always something. But the banana is an outstanding uh, crop. Again, I say if you like bananas, Hawaii's a good place. You eat all the bananas you want. If you're looking for apples, eh, you're in trouble. It is possible to grow apples up higher in the mountains around here. But uh, there are very few of us that have a parcel at 6,000 feet and another one at 600 you know, where we're growing pineapples here and apples there. doesn't happen much. Um, and so uh, temperate climate crops, uh, a few, like the strawberry or the blueberry, the blackberry, do pretty well here. Uh, you can bring a few of them with you, but by and large, it's an area for tropical crops. Pineapples thrive here. Uh, citrus does well, as long as you keep enough organic matter on the soil underneath. Uh, Citrus will produce enormous amounts of food in this environment. Of course, you know, being from California, I'm extremely happy about that. If I'm missing my oranges, I really am hurting in the heart. And so uh, that's a great thing. In general, for uh, really good, sustainable food production on this island, I do believe most people who come from non-tropical environments will find that you're going to be changing your crops. That's, uh, that's just all there is to it. There are some crops that come here and will work also in the mainland, but by and large, most things that work here don't work in the mainland, and most mainland things that work well, say in Chicago, do not grow very well here on the island. And a few crossovers, but... Uh, so it does take some getting used to if you're interested in attempting to try to maximize food production. You know, uh, it's an excellent place, uh, you know, for the production of beef, for instance. Largest cattle ranch in the United States of America is the Parker Ranch over here on the western side of the Big Island. And they produce some awesome beef. Now, you know, if you're a vegan, well, you know, traditional Polynesian diet was not a vegetarian diet, guys. You know, it's like, yeah, they ate a lot of stuff that was vegetable matter, but they also ate a lot of stuff that they had to chase it down or pull it out of the ocean with a hook. And, Hawaiians were outstanding fishermen, for instance, you know, and so, and fish is definitely an item here. And so whether you're uh, fishing for them, whether you're buying them from the fishermen or swapping them for something else you have, or raising them yourself, we have so much fresh water here that we can catch and impound. Raising fish uh, as fish farming is an outstanding way to produce food here. Uh, the fish don't need a whole lot of uh, energy input because they float in the water and so on. We have lots of clean water. Uh, the growing season over here is pretty much endless and so the fish are increasing in size every day. There's no slowdown. You, know, you can go so far as even more raising your own freshwater prawns. Ah, homegrown shrimp on the barbie. You know, this is all enticing stuff. And, uh, you know, for those of you who like to eat tilapia or like to eat catfish or you like freshwater prawns, that's great stuff. You know, chickens. Uh, chickens raise up well here. Chickens are uh, out of control everywhere throughout the islands. They were brought here by the first Polynesians and they've been brought here by everybody else since. And they are literally amok in the landscape. There are chickens everywhere. Um, and so the chicken thrives in Hawaii, and the chicken is a very, very, very important foodstuff around the entire world. Um, you know, and, and egg farming here is, is a reasonably good business. They get considerable amount of money for a dozen organic eggs on this island. And so people who love chickens and wish to make a living raising chickens and eggs here, it's, it's good business. There's always a market for wonderful fresh organic eggs here. Uh, there's never enough of them. You know, 
on the other hand just raising chicken eggs from my experience having had over 250 clucks at a time in the past uh, that's a job in itself and so when it comes down to sustainable food production and being self-sufficient well you know if you're raising chickens and then you think oh yeah I'm gonna raise some shrimp too so you get into that project and then you got citrus and bananas out there in the field well of course then you want to raise yourself some uh, broccoli and some cabbages and some Maui onions and that sort of stuff which is it's all reasonable feasible ideas but I'm telling you there's a limit okay there's a limit uh, to how much a single person can actually contribute to the pool of food because we eat such a diverse diet very few of us live on you know four or five different substances anymore there were days where our ancestors did that okay I mean, my ancestors beer was food man okay I mean, that was the way it was uh, so I had a pretty simple diet and you come up with beer and we were okay but uh, things are different today you know I mean you know people like maple syrup people like having butter on their pancakes people like having apples from Washington and blah 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 you know we, our diets are very diversified and you know, any individual person attempting to try to produce that much food stuff of that many different types uh, in a given area it's not worth it I mean, you drive yourself out of your mind that's my personal feelings my, my suggestion is that the uh, conventional small farming model is probably the best one here for this island uh, it, you know producing a, a series of diversified crops making money with those crops sharing them with the community uh, so that everybody has a chance to eat those crops in the given area uh, and then taking your money turning around and going down the road and buying something from some other farmer or going down to the uh, to the natural food market or wherever you want to shop and and picking up the other items you know many of which might have been raised in Japan might have been raised in uh, uh, in Switzerland who knows where the stuff comes from you know a lot of times uh, I think it's more in the attempt and in the mindset of a of, of, uh, trying to produce local sustainable food than in the actual uh, actually succeeding to produce 100 percent of all foods right here on the island I, I don't think that's a uh, it's it's probably not the smartest goal in the world uh, it, it just I do like to focus here on this property in growing some of the traditional crops and in growing types of crops that are um, you know carb sustainable stuff here and food that if things did get bad and there were shipping strikes or or Donald Trump decided to really take it out on Hawaii you know uh, that uh, that I, I would have food uh, to eat I, I'm not a big fan of most forms of taro but hey I got a good collection of the traditional varieties here I'm not a real big fan of green bananas on the other hand they're good vegetables uh, and you know I got lots of them here and so on so I, I have focused on trying to produce food around my house that um, under worst case scenario I could probably get by and survive on it you know macadamia nut trees here they produce nice oily protein nuts and uh, it's good food it's a little hard to get into them but it's good food uh, and so on so I got quite a variety of things but as they say a lot of the foods that we're so used to in the mainland United States the things that you commonly grow in your gardens for instance cucumbers cucumbers now cucumbers do grow well here but they have a nasty pest called the pickle worm and he's a real bugger man uh, and he'll put your cucumbers down uh, so if you're gonna do cucumbers which you can do it uh, you're gonna have to put your mind to it and I love my cucumbers I love my pickles you know I love naturally fermented pickles and I love uh, kimchi pickle and so on you know these are all favorites of mine and so uh, I go to the trouble to produce cucumbers here but it does take me uh, protective covers to keep the pickle worms off I'm using uh, biological insecticides bacteria for instance that affect the pickle worm larvas and so on um, you know it's 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 not a real sustainable form of agriculture growing cucumbers here a lot to it um, for me it's worth it you know um, but some things I grew up with like corn uh, seems to grow very well here it has the standard corn earworm like anywhere I've ever been but uh, uh, not too bad and uh, really it's an extremely good environment here for production of corn um, a little bit tough on drying hard corn you're gonna have to 
get some kind of drying facilities if you intend to grow cornmeal and popcorn. But uh, as far as sweet corn is concerned, which is how most Americans eat the stuff, uh, that's an easy crop. And it's a good crop because it's loaded with protein, it's loaded with starch, it's, it gets plenty of sugar. It's just a real vital food. And, and it can be raised here. So, you know, the answer is sure, you can do it. Um, but I would definitely look at sustainable food production here as a community effort. That's really going to be the best way to approach it. Look at the other people around you and what they might like to eat. And what can you sell them, what can you trade, and so on. Um, you'll get to meet all your neighbors, <laughs> which is another good thing. Uh, when you live out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, as far away from everybody else as you can get, uh, it's not a bad idea to be on good terms with the guy who lives next door. That's a pretty good plan. And so looking at what you do in a community basis is also very rewarding. You know, I just put a bunch of stuff on Craigslist again today to sell to other people in the area. Uh, and uh, it's always rewarding to me to have somebody call me up and go, Oh, you got Waimanalo solo papaya plants. I've been looking for them. Oh, I love solo papaya. You know, it, just, it feels good. I, I can do that sort of thing, you know. For me, uh, since, uh, as I said, I've been involved in food production, but I'm actually more of a nurseryman. I am really more of a guy who grows the plants that they use on the farms. That's, that's my real focus as a business most of my life. And uh, today, yet, that is exactly what I'm still doing. I am raising food here, and I'm selling food, and I'm growing garden crops that we eat, and so on. But I am raising a whole lot more plants that I'm selling to other people to use for raising food, and then taking the money from raising those plants and, and using it to buy ahi, you know, or other foods that I don't raise right here on the farm. Love that tuna fish, man. Can't get enough of it. Mm -mm -mm. And uh, I'm just not enough of a mariner to hit these waters out here in a skiff and try to land one of them things with a long line. Um, and so probably the rest of my life, most of the ahi tuna that I eat will probably be caught by somebody else here on the island. And I'll be growing something, making the money, and exchanging for those fish. And I think that's the way sustainable uh, food production works best have people who are each and every one of them very very specialized at what they do extremely well uh, you know and that, that hopefully within themselves they have a diversification and so on but uh, there's all kinds of problems when it comes to raising food here and one of the biggest ones actually is lack of soil uh, a lot of newbies newcomers to the island here uh, and people who are drawn to the idea of living here uh, they're oftentimes enticed by the low price of land in certain areas on these islands. Um, well, I guess I don't blame them, uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that cheap land's cheap land. And, you know, if you buy yourself a, a $10,000 acre over here, which you can find, um, it, it's probably going to be hard rock. And, you're going to have to do so much work to it before you can actually turn around and grow food on that parcel that I don't even hardly feel that it's worth the effort. That's personally, that's the way I see it. Um, better off that you pay uh, two, three, four times or more for the property if you're attempting to grow food. Is this, if this is your plan, buy a place you can put a shovel in because uh, we have plenty of soil here too, but the soil costs more. And the soil is generally in areas that will cost a little bit more than the hard rock areas. Uh, you know, hard rock living's pathetic stuff here. I, I mean, you can raise crops on hard rock lava. Uh, my friend Marvin down the street here has an entire uh, banana production farm for uh, uh, banana starts for plants. Uh, and it's all on uh, basalt. I mean, he's got some real hard blue rock over there. But Marvin has to haul in cinders, and Marvin has to haul in compost, and Marvin's pretty much got to create, uh, totally terraform the soil 
in order to do this. Uh, now there are some crops that grow a little bit better on top of pure lava than others. Uh, noni, for instance, uh, and coconut, for instance. Those two will grow pretty well on top of a barren lava flow. But in general, most plants don't really do that well there. And if you want to raise crops, I highly recommend you put out the money to buy yourself a piece of earth that you can dig with a shovel. It's got its problems too, okay. <laughs> it's just no free lunch, but uh, it's a lot easier. Uh, it's much easier to do. And so if you're attempting to try to be self-sufficient and produce your own food, I suggest that the one thing you definitely put your money into first is the land. Uh, don't buy the cheap land and then think you're going to turn it into paradise. You might, but boy, it's going to be a heck of a job. Uh, you're, you're far better off that you put forward two or three times maybe even what you thought you were going to pay for that piece of property because you'll pay it off and eventually then in the long run you'll be so glad you did that. Um, I had already set a high-end figure uh, on my shopping trip when I was over here looking for real estate. A more expensive figure than most of the rest of the land in the neighborhood. Um, as it turned out, I ended up spending twice that when I finally found the piece that was right. It's location, location, man. I will never regret the extra money I spent on buying this piece of property. And most people who come here and work with me or stay with me on this property are forever going, oh, that's a wonderful place. Yeah, well, it's because I put that first money was back here somewhere. I figured somehow or another I'd get the money to pay for the thing. It did. It's all done. We own this place, so it don't matter what the heck I paid for it. That's over the dam. And that really is the way it is with almost everything in life. What I'm getting is the value that came out of it. And so I know a lot of folks are tempted by the price of some of the cheap land here on the island and if, hey, if that's all you could ever possibly afford um, well I guess it beats the heck out of never having done it at all but if there is any way you can manage to buy a better piece you will never regret it never regret it especially if you're really thinking about producing food here you want the better land for food production not the worst land so, I have a little bit about self-sufficiency and sustainability here in, the, in Hawaii. Uh, hope I cleared a couple things up. Aloha. Happy gardening.